and good morning. And happy Father's Day. Now, now the issue is, you may not know this, but the other pastors at the church ask me to continue to be the one who schedules who does what, who preaches on what sermon, on what Sunday, and who does what text, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't blame them for the fact that on Father's Day, I am the one who appears in the pulpit. It's all my own fault. But I am here. And some of you may like it, and some of you may not, but I'm here. So let's praise God for the reality and move on. Okay, now, I never know, since I don't preach every week, and I don't know, to see things change, and processes are a little different. So uh, every time Paul greets you, he calls you his some kind of friends, which comes from somewhere out of some place, I'm sure, but I don't know where. Okay, and, and Peter always starts by praying that you get him out of the way. Pardon? Somebody gets you out of the way. I don't know who it is. You see, he wants it to be God who gets him out of the way. Now, the, the issue is, uh, they may be my sons, but I, it's all a little different when I come up. So let's just pray a bit before we, before we begin, okay? Our Father, we just ask your blessing on what's going to happen here right now. Your word has been opened before us, set before us, that you might speak to us through it. We believe that the Bible from one end to the other is your holy word. And we pray that you're going to open our minds and open our hearts so that we are receptive to the message you are intending to speak to us this morning. Thank you, Father. We give you all the glory. We praise you and ask your blessing now. Now, some of you know me pretty well, some of you don't know me too well, but let let me just tell you that I have been a pastor now for more than 55 years, most of that time in this church. And I got to tell you, that's one long time to be a pastor. During those years, I have unfortunately learned that sometimes church people are perplexing to their pastors. I cannot tell you how many times I have sat in a counseling session with church people, even some of you, and listened to your stories, appearing on the surface, I hope, calm and collected, but thinking underneath. You did what? And why did you do that? And and while I would love to give you some examples of the kinds of things that you have told me in those perplexing sessions, rest assured you are safe. As your pastor, I would never expose you unless you were one of my sons. But there have been times, in fact, and I'm going to confess this, Even right now, today, as I stand here, there have been times when some of the things some of you have decided to do perplex or perplexed me as one of your pastors. Now, in the text assigned to me by me today from the book of Galatians, the great apostle Paul is in the same place that I have been in so many times as a pastor. In the last verse of the passage assigned to me to preach to you today, Paul says to his congregation, I am perplexed about you. Now, he was the founding pastor of the church in Galatia. And now, in this writing, he is astounded by what they are doing. His pastor's heart is breaking for them because they are rejecting the gospel message that we are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For a works-based gospel about which Paul and Peter have been speaking to us over the past several weeks. Paul cannot believe what the Galatians are doing. He is saying to them, you did What? And whatever made you do it? He is perplexed by what the people he pastored are doing. Now, 
Look with me at the text. Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 to 20. Paul writes, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Now, formerly means way back then. In the good old days. Before you came to know the one true God and His great saving love for you. Way back then, in the good old days, you were a bunch of pagans who actually worshipped idols of your own making as gods. But those idols were not gods at all. He says to them, but now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? Paul says, but you came out of your enslavement. You came to know the great love of Yahweh the one true God. Or better yet, he says, you understood that you are loved by God, that you cannot save yourself, but are saved by the grace of God through faith. You came to know how deeply God loved you. So deeply that He sent His only begotten Son to earth to die so that you might live. He asked them, how can you so easily return to the good old days? Can I tell you how many times throughout my years as pastor I have heard people yearn for the good old days? He says to them, how can you so easily return to what was before? How can you reject this grace-based freedom for enslavement to a works-based salvation which can never save you at all. He is perplexed by the people he pastored. He says to them, you are observing special days and months and seasons and years. They have embraced the rituals of Judaism as a means for salvation. They are not denying Jesus as their Savior. They are saying you must have Jesus as your Savior, but you must also keep all the religious practices of Judaism too if you really want to be saved. They have embraced the lie told by the Judaizers and rejected the truth their pastors have taught them. Now, I'm going to step out here a little bit. Don't get nervous back there. In the good old days, okay, back in the good old days, you always knew who the really good Christians were. You always knew. Because they were the ones who were there on Sunday morning for worship. They were the ones who attended Sunday school. They were the ones who showed up on Wednesday night for midweek service. Okay? They did the things that were required on the surface as works of salvation, thinking that somehow, by doing those things, they were going to work themselves into the grace of God. And if they were really serious about it, you know what else they did? They tithed. And they made sure everybody knew it. Okay? Now, I'm sorry, but we're not saved by the works we do or even the goodness that we might present out of some pot of goodness somewhere, we are saved by the fact that God loved us. So much so that He sent Jesus to die for us. We are saved by grace alone. And we receive that faith by trusting Jesus alone to save us. Paul is perplexed because the Galatians have rejected that truth and are returning to the good old days. He says to them, 
I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Did they write that in capital letters on the screen behind me? Good, I wanted it in capital letters. He is a fearing for the people because he thinks that as a pastor he has been ineffectual and wasted his efforts on them. Paul's pastoral heart is broken. He is grieved because those he led to the Lord are embracing a lie taught to them by liars and rejecting the truth. Truth is, they've just wandered back to them good old days. They have returned to what always made sense to them. You cannot be saved by grace alone, they thought. You must earn your salvation too. Paul says to the Galatians, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. And then he goes on to explain what he means. He explains that when he first came to Galatia, he was sick. So sick that he could not help himself. He was powerless to free himself from the sickness with which he was plagued. He had to cast himself entirely on the grace of the Galatians. He had no money. He had no friends among them. There was no way that he could save himself from the illness that plagued him. If you will, there was no way he could save himself. But the Galatians, out of the goodness of their hearts, stepped in and provided for his care. They took care of him with no expectation of return from him. Like God, they loved him. Like God, they graced him. Paul became like them, entirely dependent upon them for his salvation from the illness that plagued him. And now he pleads with them, he begs them to see that they, like him, as he was, are now entirely dependent upon God's grace for their salvation. He begs to know why they are rejecting this gospel for another gospel which cannot save them at all. He says to them, out of a grieving heart, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? I know personally what his grieving heart is saying to those people he so loved. Like him, I have stood at the place where I have told you the truth, only to know some of you to turn your backs on me and walk away from me simply because I told you the truth. Paul is in that place where I myself have been so many times. His heart is breaking for the people he loved. Paul says to the Galatians, those people are zealous to win you over for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. He says that the reason the Judaizers are doing what they are doing is not out of love for the Galatians. It is because they want to hurt Paul. Their concern is not for the Galatians at all, nor is it for the presentation of the truth or the good of the church. They want people to be loyal to them, zealous for them. And they do not like Paul because Paul told them the truth. They are, in fact, I'm using Paul's words almost exactly. They are, in fact, 
toil, tools of Satan devised to pull down, not to build up. Paul says, it is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and always be so, not just I, when I am with you. See, see, the problem is not being zealous. In fact, we should be zealous, but we should only be zealous for the right things. We should serve God first and above all, and always be zealous for our, in our service for Him. Paul says, my dear children, for whom I again am in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone. He wishes that he could speak to them gently because he loves them. But because he loves them and realizes that they are about to drive off a cliff, he has to speak to them with urgent and what may appear to be harsh words to save them from the error which will lead them to harm. And he says to him, I have to do this because I am perplexed about you. He stops where he began. The people who he himself led to Jesus Christ. The people to whom he taught the word of the Lord are turning their backs on him and embracing a dangerous teaching which will lead them away from Christ and into eternal death. He loves them. Should he then just let them wander into error and die? Should he just be gentle and kind and peaceful and happy and let them die? Or should he speak with urgent and perhaps harsh words to save them from danger and eternal death? That's what he's asking. What should he do? Now what are the lessons from this text for us as we sit here this morning? The first lesson is this, you need to remember at all times, in all places, in every moment, that you are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And second, you need to remember that no matter how big or great or good you think you are, you cannot save yourself. We are all sinners, saved by God's grace. We are so lost in sin that we cannot bring ourselves out. We cannot save ourselves. And lesson number three, praise God alone for your salvation. Be zealous for our God. Because he loved you so much that he sent his own son to die so that you might live. Be zealous for God because he has saved you. You are nothing. You have nothing except that which has come to you by God's grace alone. To him be glory and honor and praise forever and ever. Amen. And number four, never cause your pastor, whomever he or she may be, (laughs) never cause your pastor to say, you did what? And why would you do that? And number five, 
don't get angry and turn your back on your pastor. When he tells you the truth, even if his words may seem harsh to you. Remember, he only speaks that way because he loves you and because he believes you to be in imminent danger. Amen.